I'll introduce myself, uh, Jonah Pransky. Uh, I work for Amdocs. Um, we do all kinds of what we call customer experience systems for the telecommunications market. Um, what I'll be talking about is specifically the conversion charging system. Uh, and you know, if you guys have all fallen asleep just because I said those two words, I assure you, it will be more interesting than, than all that. But we'll be talking about the conversion charging system and the implications of this new digital world on that system. Okay, and what it is that tr conversion charging has to handle. So, if I got this right, so what does the conversion charging system do? Uh, what does it have to do? Who does it need to serve? Um, really, when it comes to the digital world, the digital landscape, conversion charging has many, many masters, right? And I'm not talking about the people that have to keep it, uh, you know, running uh, on the IT side, but there's a lot of other interests as well. Um, from one, it has to really support what we would consider to be the new digital business landscape. So the business side of the house and an operator is going to be very, very interested, uh, whether they know it or not, in the capabilities of the conversion charging system to help them launch new services that are going to help shape their market and really drive them from becoming uh, what we've always considered to be communication service providers into what they're uh, aspiring to be. Uh, digital service providers. Um, the other aspect and the other master, I guess, of conversion charging would be the customer, the customer expectations. And this is something that I talk about a lot with our customers, but basically anyone can relate to it. Uh, when we think about digital businesses, uh, we think about the Amazons of the world, we don't necessarily put the communication service providers into that realm, right? Because we know that there's a lot of processes that we need to call a call center for or something like that. So conversion charging has a lot to do and say about how we can help service providers transform into digital service providers by putting the power, putting the capabilities of the conversion charging system at the hands of the, uh, of the customer. And lastly, I'd say the conversion charging has to handle and be able to live in a world of what we would call digital technology enablers. Those digital technology enablers are the things that enable a you know, carrier grade IT system to handle the changes in consumption and consumption patterns that are going on just by the fact that everyone's basically carrying you know, a computer in their hands and you know, a television in their hands and a radio in their hands and all of those things. And those things are changing the way uh, IT systems and specifically conversion charging have to operate. So in short, really what a conversion charging system has to do is enable the creation of the right offers for the digital age, delivering the right customer experience for the digital world, and using the right resources that can handle the digital consumption. So what we did is uh, we didn't just you know, assume all of these things. We did a survey uh, that we ran with IDC of 80 service providers around the world. Uh, you can see the breakdown of you know uh, Latin America, APAC, North America, and Europe, really from across the communications industry. I know this is you know super mobility, but uh, you know we did speak to some fixed line operators, some cable and satellite operators as well. Um, we spoke to people with decision making responsibility or people that were involved in the decision making process, and we spoke to large operators. If you were paying attention, you realize that the label on those last two tables has been switched. Uh, if you weren't paying attention, pay more attention. Okay, uh, so we spoke to large operators, people with uh, 50 million plus subscribers, 10 to 50 million plus subscribers. Those are the kinds of service providers that IDC spoke to on our behalf. So here are some of the results. Uh, in terms of the digital strategy overall, what we did is we asked the service providers, well, do you have a digital service strategy in place? Now that may mean a million different things to a million different people, but uh, most of them were able to answer. 71% said yes, we do have a digital strategy in place. A further 18% said no, it's not in place yet, but we're working on it. So by and large, the industry is prepared, strategically at least, for the digital world. But when we spoke to the IT guys, 
49% of them says, well, our charging system doesn't actually really support that strategy particularly well. And 56% of them said that this digital strategy is actually going to be the, uh, the impetus for some upgrades of the uh, uh, charging system in the near future. So, on the one hand, digital strategy in place. On the other hand, not really clear whether or not the current charging systems are handling digital strategy all that particularly well. Just one note, uh, the timer's actually not running, so you're gonna have to let me know <laughs> when I'm running over time. You're doing great now. I'll pass up. You've got about 10 to 15 more minutes. Okay. So let's talk about what this digital strategy is all about. So we asked service providers about that, and we asked in sort of different areas, right? We spoke about the digital business landscape, digital customer experience, and we spoke about uh, digital technology enablers. So in the digital customer experience, we asked them, we said, what is the most important, or what are, and you know, it wasn't mutually exclusive, what were the most important on-device aspects of the charging system or capabilities that you want to enable for your customers. So there was a tie uh, for first place. 53% said the ability to order and purchase new goods on consumer on customer devices. That is uh, not shocking, right? No one will be surprised that service providers are trying very hard to move their customers over to self-service channels, right? And the device is just one new one of those. What's probably a little bit more innovative is the fact that they said what we'd like is the ability for customers to build their own plan on their devices. Right now, service providers have to go and build out all the products and then bundle those things into separate different plans with the uh, corresponding bolt-ons and add-ons and services that are the, to be built on top of those. Uh, and that's no easy task. What you have is a big service providers like Verizon's and ATT's in the world with product catalogs of hundreds if not thousands of products. Wouldn't it be easier if we could just give the cu customer a device that they're carrying around anyway and say, you know what, you tell me what you want in your plan. So that's something that they'd like to do. Now, when we're talking about an on-device experience for customers, there's a couple of different things that you could do and that one should do. Um, there are a couple of use cases here on the board. So one would be account management and adjustment, right? Uh, I have a plan already, um, but I might need to make some adjustments. If we think about some very common uh, things that we have today in the industry, like shared plans, it would be nice to be able to sort of allocate some of that shared plan, at least to some sort of soft limit, to different members of the shared plan. So you might have mom and dad with unlimited access to whatever data is in the shared plan, but the kids are, you know, set on some sort of soft limit so that they don't go off the rails with your digital, uh, with your data. Uh, again, we mentioned build your own plan. That's something that we're seeing very much uh, when we speak to our customers. Our customers are. Uh, you know, some of the biggest service providers from around the world, a lot of uh, Asia Pacific service providers are looking to let their customers build their own plans. And ironically, some of the North American providers are looking there and saying, hey, how can we put, turn this to our advantage as well? I would say perhaps the most interesting on-device experience that you can do, and it's different from these first two, would be what I called usage alerts and upsells via over-the-top apps, right? So. The first two relate to a world whereby service providers are trying very hard to gain some foothold in a digital uh, ecosystem or landscape that they haven't had in the past. Service provider apps are not the most popular apps out there in the app stores. They're not the ones that are used all that much. And so if we create a compelling event why you would want to go to my service provider app, then maybe this is two ways to do it. The other one is philosophically different, that last one. If I know that from a digital perspective, customers are going to over-the-top applications, why not use those applications to communicate directly with my charging system, right? So if you have a popular video streaming uh, application, maybe that popular video streaming application can say, hey, we've checked, you're uh, running around 80% of your data usage, maybe it's time to buy a top-up or a bolt-on uh, so that you don't run out of high-speed data. 
So further on in terms of the digital business landscape, we asked service provider, what are the top priorities for your consumer business going forward that you need convergent charging to handle? So 89% said that our top priority is real-time charging for gaming and entertainment. Uh, this was followed pretty closely by mobile payments and financial services. Uh, what's clear from both of those things is that service providers are extremely interested in becoming part of what I would consider to be the digital economy, right? Whether it's paying for things digitally or selling more digital goods and services. If we talk specifically about entertainment and digital commerce, that means charging has to do a couple of things. It has to enable the creation of innovative offers. Um, it's tempting to say that the world of online entertainment and gaming is really just a subscription world and there's no complexity there. But if you ask Amazon or other people that are doing a good job of selling online content, not only through subscription basis, but also through electronic sell-through or other types of VOD and rental, then we know that it can be much more complicated than that. That's something that service providers are gonna wanna do. Those rate plans that the charging system has to handle need to be flexible. They need to be flexible enough so that I can create a product that says I want five of a particular theme or genre of entertainment, right? And that becomes a product and a plan. The charging system has to be able to communicate seamlessly across devices and across the customer experience. This is not trivial, uh, particularly for legacy providers of entertainment systems where they have a lot of uh, old legacy systems alongside new all IP networks, that is not an easy thing always to communicate across. Even something as simple as saying, I've bought something online, I want to watch it at my home, is, not, is no trivial uh, fact, and the charging system can help bridge that gap. And of course, it has to be done quickly, but of course, everything needs to be done quickly, including this presentation, because I can now see how much time I've got left. So, I'm going to move on. Uh, to digital technology enablers. Uh, uh, since it says 5G over here, I, I, I should at least say the, that combination, 5G. I'm not gonna talk about it a lot, uh, but we asked service providers, we said, so what are the big digital uh, or technology enablers that convergent charging is going to have to handle going forward? And we got some varying um, we got some very varying results uh, on this question. So what you're looking at here are the global results. Spoiler, I'll give you some very different looking results when we carve out just North America. Okay, so globally, uh, support for unique 4G and 5G services was considered to be the number one technology in plans for charging systems globally, okay? Everyone wants to make sure that their charging systems can handle 4G, 5G, and whatever services are dependent specifically on those things. I've called out Volti from, from that uh, here as well. Um, very similarly, 81% uh, said that the main motivator for any sort of charging evolution is actually support for next generation network services, among which, again, 4G, Volti, 5G. So service providers are clearly aware that actually delivering on the promise of these networks in terms of the customer experience, in terms of the value that they bring, these networks that they advertise quite aggressively, they spend a lot of money on uh, rolling out, uh, is optimal, right? It's, it's of, the highest, um, it's of the, uh, the, the highest order in terms of its importance. Sometimes, though, it's the little things that can um, kind of trip you up. So rolling out 4G uh, seems to be big, right? And we should talk about emerging markets where still have places where those are not fully rolled out. Um, it's not a situation whereby you can say, once it's out there and once we've got the device in the hands of the people, we are going to easily uh, start to sell and deliver an amazing customer experience. What you're looking at is some information from a case study that we did with a customer of ours, uh, uh, who, who I, I can't name, but it's a, in a, 
uh, Asia Pacific, uh, Southeast Asia. Um, they actually were dealing with, I guess, a perfect storm of complexity when it came to their market. Uh, there was a massive increase in percentage terms of smartphone adoption. There was a rollout of 4G LTE um, and a big push towards more postpaid usage as opposed to prepaid. And as they delivered all these things, more smartphones, 4G LTE, and, um, pre and postpaid, they found that people using uh, streaming video, uh, specifically on YouTube, were finding stuttering and uh, you know, buffering and lags. And this is exactly what you don't want if your you know, new strategy is to conquer the postpaid world because the ARPUs are six, seven times what they are for prepaid. So they looked down into it and they said, well, we got all the elements, we got the smartphones, we got the networks, we got the customers, so what's going wrong? And like I said, sometimes it's the little things. So the process of um, the charging system setting what we call a, da a data reservation, right? So the network, we open up a session on the network, the network says, all right, uh, carve out a little bit of their data plan so that nothing else uses this so that I can charge them for it once they close the session. Now what they had was a situation where they were carving out very, very, very small chunks, 250 kilobytes. That was fine when all of data was just messaging. But when data is 4G LTE mobile video, 250 kilobytes was not cutting it. So what kept on happening is a session kept requesting more uh, data reservation. In a session, uh, the diameter signaling was going back and forth and back and forth to the point where the end user experience was not good. So what we did is we applied what we call dynamic quota allocation, right? So if you are using a, opening up a data session and the rate of using that data is quite small, for instance, I'm just sending messages, that's no big deal. We can stay with that 250 kilobytes and that's fine. But for those data hungry applications and for those customers that are using 4G, we want to create bigger data reservations. You can see the results as soon as we implemented this. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a big drop. I wonder if I got a pointer here. Yeah, there's a big drop right there, right? So you can see where we implemented the dynamic load allocation. You can see it over here. Immediately, 40% reduction in transactions per second in terms of the network signaling with the, uh, with the charging system. Further, if we talk about, I promised that this is the spoiler here. Um, in North America, there is a different view as to what's important in terms of technology in the charging system. And this could just be a function of the fact that North America is a little bit further ahead with their advanced network rollouts. Obviously, 4G uh, is a thing. We're having uh, announcements now about LTE Advanced being rolled out and offered commercially as well. And of course, the big operators here in North America are quite ahead of the curve when it comes to 5G. Uh, you probably heard some stuff about that uh, this morning. So for them, it's not a matter of 4G or Volte or 5G. In North America, there are other things that they need from the, co from the conversion charging system to be in place in order to handle the digital consumption model. So in North America, we had tied for number one was cloud deployment, and no SQL data stores, okay? No SQL data stores basically putting big data technology into the operational environment of a charging system. And we asked them as well, what is the preferred delivery model for cloud? And the general consensus, 89%, said that private cloud is the preferred model to deploy my charging system. I would rather not put my charging system, which is quite sensitive, obviously, on the public cloud. I'd rather put that on a private cloud uh, that may be on my premises so that I have some more security. So let's talk a little bit about those things. And I promise to leave some time uh, for questions at the end, but I'm also happy to take them if you guys just really just must ask a question right now. That's fine. I'll, I'll take them. Um, Convergent charging on the cloud or cloud-based convergent charging uh, is something that is a journey that we've been on for 
uh, a couple of years now. Uh, we had the first uh, online charging system certified over VMware. Uh, and we have actually um, conversion charging in virtualized environments in private cloud implementations, uh, as you can see, all over the world. And we are putting them through their paces. Right? You can see some of the, uh, of the KPIs of these systems, 100,000 transactions per second for real-time charging in a virtualized cloud environment, handling 60 million subscribers in online prepaid and postpaid charging. Uh, these are, by the way, not necessarily all from the same implementation. We're just taking uh, you know, some KPIs that, that are showing you that what we're doing is making sure that a cloud-based charging system is still delivering the type of carrier-grade KPIs that one that a uh, top tier service provider expects. Uh, handling 130 million subscribers online uh, for postpaid subscribers and having under five millisecond latency in the system. These are things that we have proven are not just a vision and a hope that we can deliver on, but that we're actually delivering on. So when we think in terms of well, does charging need to move to the cloud? Does charging need to be cloud ready or cloud native? The answer is it already is. And yes, they are, our, our customers are uh, realizing benefits from those things. Um, the essential application properties are that it needs to be monitored at all times in real time. It needs to be able to scale and that scaling to be triggered automatically. Uh, the cloud management system has to be able to spin up VMs automatically and those VMs have to have the, uh, the uh, templates for the charging system so that we can move over uh, customer and subscriber groups to the new VMs without any uh, break in uh, delivery of capacity. Um, and of course, we want to be able to spin those things back down when the need is no longer there for so many virtual machines. Okay. And just touching on uh, that other issue, right, the NoSQL in the operational environment, uh, this is as well a, um, a, a, a trend or a request that we have been working on for some time now. Uh, what we're doing uh, is taking Hadoop, big data, whatever you want to call it, whichever buzzword uh, you want to call it, and not only using it for you know, the basis for big data lakes for analytics, but also putting it into the operational environment to work as the usage database for the charging system. That means this Hadoop database is having events streamed to it in real time, it can handle real time usage queries, and it can handle all of the things that a SQL based database is expected to do at less cost. Uh, and with more flexibility to do things like support Big data. You know, part of that is a function of how, big data analytics, I'm sorry. Part of that is a function of how this new um, database is architected. And part of it is the fact that if I have, if I'm able to save data, save data at lower cost, I can simply save more of it. I don't have to make some of those complicated uh, decisions that I had to make before and say, some of these fields I'll save, some of them I won't. Uh, three months back is enough. Six months, is it, uh, six months, I won't. And that's obviously going to provide a richer base of data for, uh, for analytics. So uh, we're just about the time, uh, five minutes left, to uh, stop and say if there, ask if there are any questions. Uh, of course, if there aren't any questions, don't feel bad. I have uh, a question. You have a question. Good, thank you, yeah. because I was going to really feel bad if I didn't have any questions. <laughs> so <laughs> when do you expect these on-device plans to actually realistically be rolling out to the consumer? So these types of on-device plans are already out there uh, with some of our customers. Um, what we have is different types of on-device plans. Uh, I, I, I can't name names, but there are uh, customers of ours in North America who have on-device capabilities that I was describing in terms of account management, whereby I can set those soft limits for people within my shared plan and set alerts and do some upselling if, you know, the alert warrants it. That's happening in North America already. Uh, for some of these more interesting ones, I don't want to say more interesting, let's say uh, more innovative, no, that's probably not so good either, whatever. Probably these other ones where you're building your own plan, those are things that are happening today uh, in Asia Pacific. Um, 
In the Philippines, uh, we have a customer that's doing this for both prepaid and postpaid. They have two different uh, sort of offerings for prepaid, uh, where you can build your own plan, and for postpaid, where they have something that they, they sort of create mini bundles, which you can then cobble together in order to do, uh, because of you know, reasons of, of their own. Although these, these plans are obviously public, uh, you know, sometimes we, we don't like to you know, uh, promote our place in those, except for at trade shows when I'm talking to you know, a couple hundred of my closest friends. Um, so, but those things are actually out there and we're seeing more and more interest from service providers to help them deploy those types of build your own plan on device type of capabilities. So yeah, so that was a good question, thanks. So we have time for one more quick question. Otherwise, I think Jonah will hang out to the side of the stage for a few minutes if you're yeah. more comfortable with one-on-one -on -one questioning. He seems pretty friendly. Yeah. One more quick question, anybody? Then we are going to roll right into our next presentation. Put your hands together. Big thank, thank you, you very to Jonah much. I appreciate it, guys. Thank for chatting you. with us.